My name is Samet Elfen. I'm a senior data scientist uh, with Sophos, and I'm here today to present to you one of the projects we've been working on within the Sophos AI group, and that is um, automating false positive whack-a-mole with real-time behavioral analytics. Um, so before we jump into the presentation, I would like to give a shout out to all my colleagues who have uh, worked on the bigger effort that this project is part of, um, involving data cleaning, pre-processing, um, labeling, as well as um, research and anyways, brainstorming ideas and such. Um, so we have Ben Gelman, uh, Denis Wozniuk, Dora Sabo, Konstantin Berlin, uh, Tamás Vorosh, who will actually be presenting another project this afternoon, and uh, last but not least, Victor uh, Holo. Um, so before we dig into any details, here's an outline uh, so you have an idea about what we're going to be talking about. Um, so first we will go over the problem statement, so what is it that we're trying to solve. Um, so we will explain briefly what a security operations center is, SOC for short, um, as well as the problem of alert fatigue, which is exactly what we set out to solve. Then we will go over our pr uh, proposed solution, which comes in the form of a machine learning model that uses historical contextual features to solve this problem. And finally, we will go over our evaluation setup and the results we've obtained. So yeah, what is um, the problem that we're trying to solve? So first of all, uh, it's important to understand what a security operations center is. Uh, that would be a SOC. Um, so it's a unit that employs three main building blocks, people, processes, and technology uh, with the objective of defending, uh, defending an organization from uh, any cybersecurity threats and incidents that might be out there. Um, it's also worth mentioning that the SOC can be tasked and concerned uh, with defending the organization that it is part of, or it can be offered as a service by one company to many other customer organizations that subscribe to this service, so the SOC has to defend all of them. Um, so just to give like a very generic um, workflow of the SOC, first there are the customer endpoints, so those are their machines, desktops, laptops, everything, and the SOC works to collect that data so every single event that happens on those endpoints, all the processes that are running everything um, is logged. And um, usually at the level of the data collection step, they also unify that log, uh, the formats of these logs uh, for easier processing down the line. After that, every single event that was logged now has to uh, go through a phase of monitoring via security sensors or um, detectors. And that's a layer of detectors. Those are usually uh, rule-based or heuristic-based, and uh, they have been engineered to leverage the domain expertise of the security analysts uh, in capturing what might be uh, malicious. Now, every single event that comes in has to go through these detectors. And these detectors can be as simple as a rule that says, um, if there's a process that is writing to multiple files within a very short time span, then notify on that. Maybe there's a problem underway. It can be so if maybe like there's a ransomware that's running, or it can be just some network administrator who's trying to modify multiple uh, files very quickly. So, these detectors really try to cast a wide net to capture even needle in the haystack attacks. So after our logged events go through the security sensors, we get alerts. Those are our events with some added information from the detectors. And one of the most important things is the severity score. Uh, that's a value given uh, by the detector to the event, saying that this is how bad I think this might be. It can be a value from one to five, one to 10, um, whatever really the SOC picks. Now once we have these alerts, there's usually a thresholding step, and that is where um, the SOC uses some empirically found threshold. For instance, if they have severity scores ranging from one to five, they may pick three, and so anything that gets a score that's higher than three requires analysts' attention. So after this thre thresholding, we just keep those severe scores, so for instance, higher than three, uh, severe alerts, and those are the ones that now the security analysts, those are like humans, it's their job to sit down and look at these to investigate um, what happened before this event, after this event, is this really something bad or is it actually just leg legitimate activity? Now, um, it's important to think about the amount of data that the SOC has to deal with. So on any given day, they get millions of events um, that they collect, those come from all the endpoints of all their customers all around the world. 
uh, possibly, and those might end up triggering tens of thousands of rules from the detectors. And finally, that leads to um, hundreds of to be inspected uh, alerts with more than 50% of them being false alarms, meaning that uh, this is well documented by multiple studies and surveys that were done uh, regarding SOX, and it means that um, because those detectors are cast in very wide nets, even with the severity thresholding, we end up with a lot of severe alerts uh, that are actually nothing. It was just uh, someone doing their normal functions on the endpoints and nothing bad was happening there. Um, so this is precisely the issue here. So that's what we call alert fatigue. It's that the number of alerts that are generated far exceeds security analysts' capacity to deal with them, and that makes their job absolutely exhausting and demotivating. So in order to illustrate this, here's um, over a one month period from March 2022 to April 2022, and every single bar here represents the alert uh, count for that day. Um, we are not disclosing the exact values because we consider that sensitive data, but the most important takeaway from this plot is, as you can see for, from each bar for every single day, the dark orange part is uh, very tiny compared to the light orange part, and the light orange are those false alarms. So all of these, uh, the height of these bars is the amount of work that the analysts have to put. Uh, that's the amount of alert counts that they get but only a small proportion of those are actually um, real threats that they should uh, be looking into. So analyst time and energy is actually wasted on this deluge of irrelevant noise, and that, leaves, uh, that, that runs the risk of uh, actual threats going unnoticed. And for us, we think that determining which alerts and incidents can be ignored, so reducing that light-shaded area, is as crucial as deciding which ones are actually important and worth investigating. So our proposed solution comes in the form of an intelligent safeguard system, a temporal model, uh, that uses machine learning um, to really distill the critical alerts and suppress the false alarms. And um, this, um, this model can be implemented on top of existing detection pipelines because it acts on alerts. So regardless of what detectors ASOC may have, they can benefit from such a solution. And uh, this uh, model is supposed to act as a shield. So it acts, uh, it comes between the severe incoming alerts and the analysts and is supposed to really act as a filtering funnel where we get all of, that, all of the incoming alerts with the noise that's there and the false alarms and everything, and we really try to bubble up those interesting cases. So the pipeline is very simple. Like I say, we are acting on severe alerts, so that's, that's our starting point. After that, we extract some features, build our feature vectors, uh, pass them through an XGBoost model which scores them. And those scores can be later used either to eliminate false positives if we find a good threshold for that, or to prioritize alerts um, um, by importance so that analysts know that what's on top, what they see at the top are actually the important alerts and what's uh, at the bottom is actually quite low priority. So the most important step here is the feature extraction part. So uh, we are computing features over different time windows, so ranging from one second up to a week. Uh, we, also do, um, we also compute them on the basis of a variety of predicates. So we have features that are computed on a customer base or an endpoint base or a detector base. Uh, as an example, uh, here are some like uh, two of the many features we compute. So we can capture the number of customers for which a given detector has fired over the previous hour or minute or whatever time window. And uh, as well uh, as the, for example, the number of alerts that were encountered on a given endpoint over the previous day. So we are trying to design uh, these features such that they can capture signals like the endpoint vulnerability, uh, the customer state size, and detector firing behavior patterns. So I don't know, for instance, there's like a new detector that was added to the appliances that are already there. It can happen that this detector was too broad of a rule or just poorly tuned, human error, these things happen. And so as soon as that uh, detector 
is uh, deployed, it just starts firing across all of the customer states, uh, across all the customer base all around the world. So we are, it's really important for us to capture these things, to be able to tell whether um, after anchoring this alert in the global context, is it actually important or not. And uh, in order to evaluate how, uh, how this uh, system fares, we have taken a data set of uh, real enterprise alerts uh, from uh, Sophos, and we collected those in collaboration with security and data analysts to really inline the labeling and uh, have a clean data set. And the data set ranges over a six month period and we do a time split. So we take the five first months of that data and that would be our uh, training set. So it ranges from uh, October 2021 to March 2022. And then we have our test set from uh, March 2022 uh, to April 2022. And these alerts come from over 3000 customers uh, and over 15,000 endpoints or hosts. Uh, on the left-hand side, we can look at the label, uh, label distribution for the two uh, sets, so for the training and the test. Uh, we can readily see that there the positives are uh, a smaller proportion um, than the negatives, meaning this also points out to the problem that we were talking about, that these severe alerts that the uh, analysts have to look through, most of them are actually uh, nothing. Um, and in order for us to evaluate this model, we look at uh, two, we try to look at two different aspects. So we try to look at the classification performance using metrics such as the receiver operating uh, characteristics or ROC AUC uh, area under curve, precision recall, as well as we try to simulate the deployment of this system to see how it would impact that workload uh, of analysts. So first, looking at the raw curve. So the raw curve plots the uh, true positive rate versus the false positive rate, and uh, it does so at different decision thresholds. So what that means is, so our model, so our temporal model outputs um, prediction probabilities, so values from zero to one that capture how, com how, what the, how probable the model thinks a particular severe alert is worth an analyst's time. And you can pick different decision thresholds to say, to, to translate that prediction probability value to a decision that yes, this is important or no, this is not important. So with the rock curve, we can plot at every single possible decision th threshold value, our true positive rate and false positive rate. And the summary or the most important, one of the most important measures within the rock curve is what we call the AUC. That's the area under curve, literally the area between the curve and the X axis. And the closer to one we are, the better we're doing. Now, in, the, in purple, in the diagonal line, we have the current situation where there is no model that's deployed and every single severe alert, analysts have to look at it, and that's a 50% AUC. As opposed to that, with our temporal model, we are able to reach a, an 81% on this particular data set um, AUC. So we're doing like much better, and we are, this model is able to really um, um, to really distinguish between the positives and the negatives. Uh, the other plot is also a raw curve, but it's a precision recall curve, so it plots precision uh, versus recall. Uh, precision is the positive predictive value, and it basically tells us out of everything that the model thought was a positive, um, how many of those were correct, so it captures this measure. And recall is essentially the same as true positive rate. And here we can see that we are able to reach an AUC of 0.63 and at any uh, even higher recall values, we are able to reach a precision that is much higher than the current uh, situation with uh, its baseline precision being just 30%. Now, in order to look at this in a more tangible way to illustrate what we are doing, here's a similar plot to the one we've seen earlier. Earlier, we've seen without the model what the daily life of analysts look like, and that's the orange scenario here. And in blue, we have, with our model, implemented what the reality would look like. So we can see the first striking thing is that on that one month of data, the alert volume for every single day is much uh, lower with our model deployed. So we can say undoubtedly that yes, we are able to reduce the amount of work that analysts have to do. But the 
striking thing is that we are able to do that while capturing most of the relevant alerts. So whatever we do to reduce the alert volume comes uh, at the expense of the false alarms. And that can be seen here by uh, comparing the dark orange and the dark blue. So those on most days meet. And that means that those are the critical alerts and we are able to capture them. As opposed to that, for the lighter orange and lighter blue, those are the false alarms. So we are able with our model to, redu to reduce those significantly. Uh, especially on days like the fourth from there, uh, from the left and the fourth from the right as well, where we can see that those were days where there was catastrophic false positives. So there are some extremely high peaks of false alarms. Upon analy analyzing such days, we found that usually it's indeed a poorly tuned detector that just starts firing over many customers' estates or one specific customer, or maybe there was some network administrator who was doing some tasks on that particular day and just the detectors may have gone crazy on it. And we can see that on those particular day where it's very crucial to reduce the alert volume, our model is really able to do that. To have a slightly different perspective on the same uh, points, on the same data points, we can look at specifically the percentage of uh, false alarms that we're reducing, that's the gray bars. And on average, every day we remove about 40% of the false alarms. At the same time, we can look at the blue bars, and that would be uh, the recall or the detection rate or the true positive rate, and it's quite high on every day. And we are able to tune uh, the threshold that we pick uh, for our model to be able to improve upon this recall. Now to take a look at what these, the model scores mean when taken in contrast to uh, analysts' notes, we, can, we have ranked by uh, the prediction probabilities of the model, uh, the alerts that, we've, uh, that were on our test set. And if we take the top, we see those are the, the alerts that the model is quite confident that those are important, those are relevant and should be looked at. And we can compare them to the analyst notes. And here we see just from the sheer length of these notes that there has there was some work done by analysts. They had to do an investigation and an analysis to really look at this data. Um, as opposed to that, we can look at the, low, the ones that got a very, very low probability uh, from the model, and those are actually the true negatives. Those are truly things that are just noise. And if we look at here the analyst notes, we can see that they just write, oh, this is benign activity, or wait, this is known FP. We've seen this before. It's a false positive. We know it. So they had to do some looking into this alert, but then they realized, okay, there's nothing here. So the model is able to to find those. Um, in, the third, um, in the third alert here, we can see that although they had to do, they were not sure, they, they hadn't seen this before, and they had to do some investigation, it, said, um, it says then that based on this evidence, we believe this to be a false positive. So the model was able to al also capture this one. Now, in order to look at those critical cases, that, uh, the critical alerts that we are missing, uh, because maybe we need to tune the threshold higher and such, uh, we can look at these, and these are the false negatives. So these are things that are critical, but the model was not so confident in that they are critical. And if we look at the notes here, so yes, analysts had to do some investigation, but for most of the notes from our analysis of these, uh, they contacted the customer to double check that it wasn't some pen testing that they were doing or anything, but the customer never responded, so we couldn't really say whether these were bad or good, so we just, um, so the model was also a bit um, doubtful for these ones. But in order for us to close the gap on these false negatives, we are working on uh, tuning this model, on monitoring it uh, every single week and retraining it on new data. But we are also working on a different model. And that's actually one of the next steps that we are uh, actually already started doing. So we are looking to take this model that takes contextual data and fuse it or combine it with a model that actually looks, as, looks at the alert themselves. So then we have two orthogonal models using orthogonal signals. And maybe we, by combining them, we are able to reach even, to get even better better results. And actually, so far, our results, our experimental results have shown that we are able to have a much higher rock AUC with this ensemble, sometimes by plus uh, 7%. 
And like I said, uh, this is a, an ongoing project, so we are continuously monitoring the results uh, week by week uh, because we are also working on inlining the labeling and such, so we really, want to, we really want to keep monitoring how the model is doing as the detector technology evolves and changes over time. And finally, we are uh, working on a research paper that we want to publish um, this year, hopefully, that would summarize all of our results with the stateful model that uses information from the alerts and this model that uses information from the context. Um, so, yeah, finally, to conclude, um, the, the current detector technology appliances are rule-based and heuristic-based, as we've said earlier. So they are notoriously error-prone. So the consequence of this is that it ends up being super time consuming, exhausting, and very expensive for security operators to manually investigate every single incoming alert. So we propose a system that can be implemented agnostically and regardless of the existing detection workflows and uh, can automatically reduce the amount of to be inspected alerts while ensuring that the really critical ones are brought to analysts' attention and are bubbled up. And while doing so, it ensures that a significant portion of the time wasting for false alarms are actually um, eliminated. Um, so yeah, that was that. Was that. Uh, thank you very much. And yeah, if you have any questions or want to learn more about what we do at Sophos AI, please ping me or yeah, check our microsite. So thank you very much. Thanks. Anybody with any question at this time? The contact information is up on the screen. Oh, we have a question there. Just a moment, please. Um, I really enjoyed your presentation and I have a question that what's the trait or what's that point where you say that this uh, model can be applied and uh, used to reduce the false positives and grant that the possible false negatives, uh, yes, the false negatives are uh, um, biased and uh, take that uh, risk to um, to reduce the fatigue for the employees um, so uh, that's a great question because that's something we're thinking about like um, at what's like uh, what are we risking by missing some of the actual critical alerts versus reducing false of uh, the alert fatigue so what we're trying to think now because this is still in the development phase like i said we are trying to use another model that would bring this new signals completely that are not seen by this model and we've already found that it's able to really improve uh, the the model's results we're also trying if i just go back quickly to this plot um, so we can tune which decision threshold we use and we can just pick one that is at a very very high recall to be able to say that um, because the recall means what what percentage what percent percentage of the critical alerts are we catching so if we for example pick the threshold at one so 100 percent of them then we are sure that we're not missing ones but at the same time if we pick that 100 percent recall then we're also letting in many of the false positives as well so like i said our approach is first to try to improve on these models results and also that maybe we can frame this as a prioritization uh, system and not as a system that suppresses alerts. So it would just maybe rank them. So they still have to look at all of them, but it's easier because then they know that, okay, at the top, these are some that we think confidently are bad, but they still have to look at the other ones. Uh, yeah. Awesome, thank you. Sure. Is the 
anything else from anybody this time? It would appear not, uh, Salma. Cool. So once again, thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.